Okay, so hi everybody. Welcome back to Science and Nature. Uh, for everybody who's watching from Facebook Live, just for a bit of housekeeping, we love to know where you're tuning in from. Um, and also if you have any questions, just leave them in the comment box under the live video and we will get to your questions at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna do a little countdown for your TV. So three, two, one, your TV, it's all yours. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Science and Nature Untapped, a free virtual monthly speaker series brought to you by the River Institute. My name is Stephanie Hildebrand, and I will be your host for this evening. So before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that many of us are living on unceded land and traditional territory of Indigenous peoples. We are grateful for the opportunity to to live where we do, and we thank all the generations of people who have continued their responsibilities to Mother Earth since time immemorial. So for, my, for, for myself, I live on Haudenosaunee territory on the Upper St. Lawrence River. You may live somewhere else in the world. So if you were curious whose land you're living on or whose land you're visiting, you can visit native-land.ca uh, to learn more. If you're interested in learning more about the events at the River Institute, our programs, our education, uh, the research that we're doing, you can follow us on the social media at the following handles. Also, if ever you wanted to watch uh, any Science and Nature untapped event uh, that we did previously, you can go to riverinstitute.ca slash untapped. You can also go back to the Facebook event and you'll find the recording there as well. So many of our programs and events such as these are generously sponsored and supported um, by donors. So if ever you were interested in making a donation to the River Institute, you can go to riverinstitute.ca slash donate, but also just you know sharing our content on social media and speaking to your friends about what we do goes a really long way and we appreciate everything that you do uh, with and for us. So, And so for tonight, we are going to be learning about native insects and invasive mollusks, rivals for domination of the depths. So Dr. David Bruce Kahn is Gunn Professor of Biology at the Berry College One Health Center, Associate of Invertebrate Zoology at Harvard University Museum of Comparative Zoology and Senior Scientific Advisor on International Issues for the U.S. State Department while serving as a member of the White House National Security Subcommittee on Foreign Animal Threats. While a professor at New York's St. Lawrence University, he chaired the multi-sectoral international St. Lawrence River Zebra Mussel Task to mitigate the spread of invasive European mollusks through Great Lakes systems. He is an editor for several scientific journals, has been president of three international scientific societies, and is currently vice president of the Global Invasive Net Organization. ProfCon continues to build collaborating teams around the globe with research spanning many areas of the life sciences. His work on the St. Lawrence River began in 1985 with plans to continue into the future. So. Uh, Bruce, thank you for being here, and it's all yours. You may share your screen. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping you can see my screen now and uh, the, the title page for my presentation, but let me start off by thanking Stephanie and also everyone there at the River Institute uh, what she did not say is that even though I've been working on the St. Lawrence River for many years, several decades actually, uh, I've been away for a few years and it was just this last year that I've started back intensively doing research on the river and it's very exciting to me and what a wonderful time to come back then and to be with people at the Institute here and to be with all of you who are watching. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to get right into the presentation and talk about something that is not really very visible to many people in the St. Lawrence River or in any body of water for that matter. And that is the insects and some of the mollusks that live on the bottom, benthic organisms, bottom dwelling organisms that live in many cases in very deep uh, parts of the river. 
And as I'll show you uh, later, in some cases, they also live in very high current areas. So they're very difficult to study. So we don't see much of them, uh, but we've been doing research so that we can illuminate some of this uh, to one who's interested in the river. The primary things I'm gonna be talking about uh, today will be what we call caddis flies. Actually in New York State, they call them shad flies, but shad fly is a term that can refer to uh, both caddis flies and also mayflies. Both of these are groups that live all of their lives in the water, but emerge for very brief periods onto land where they mate and then lay their eggs back in the water again. But in the St. Lawrence River, it's the caddis flies that really dominate. Uh, the caddis flies are relatives of moths and butterflies, and you'll see in a picture in a minute how much they look like little moths. They are very advanced insects. Uh, they are among the most highly evolved insects that we know. But even though they look like moths and fly on the wing during mating periods, uh, they are worm-like aquatic larvae most of their lives. And uh, they are in many cases very dominant in the ecosystems where they live. Caddisflies are also some of the most amazing insects. Uh, they are sometimes called the underwater architects because they build little cases of various types, each species, each group with their own particular type of case that it builds out of sand grains, small rocks, uh, little pieces or fragments of vegetation and so forth. And so they live in those and that gives them protection, also helps in their feeding. They are common all over the world, uh, wherever you go in the world, except for the Antarctic and the high Arctic. Uh, you will see caddis flies. And in some species, there are massive emerging uh, swarms that come out every summer or every spring uh, for mating. Uh, these have been especially noticed in Montreal, for example, over the years, these large uh, emerging uh, swarms, caddis flies. It can be a bit of a nuisance at times. The main species that I'm going to talk about is the dominant species in the most narrow stretch of the river. It's called Brachycentris incanus. Brachycentris incanus, again, it's an insect, a member of the order Trichoptera, family Brachycentridae. And again, I will mostly refer to them as caddisflies here, which is their more proper entomological name rather than shadfly. This is a picture of the uh, caddisflies in Northern New York. This is in Ogdensburg, just across the river from Prescott, Ontario. And this is what they look like typically the last week of May. It's the last week of May that this particular species that we never see throughout the rest of the year, they come swarming out of the river and they literally cover the roads. They sometimes have to be carried off in uh, dump trucks. Uh, there are so many of them, literally in the multiple millions. Early June is when they usually depart, so the last week of May, the first week of June. And when they're in, going through their mating swarms, it's really interesting. If you were to run a net through the air, you would get almost entirely males. Females, on the other hand, tend to hang out in the trees. So they, they get under the vegetation and they hang out. So if you sweep the trees, uh, you get females. When a female finally gets up the nerve, she will fly out into the swarm of males. And usually there will be several males that will uh, go after her. They will fall to the ground. And you see them like this on the ground, just covering the ground all along the river shores. And that's where they copulate, mate, and then the female returns back to the river to take her eggs. This is a picture I like to show just as a reminder that even though these things can be a nuisance because there are so many of them, they're actually beautiful little insects. Again, as you see, they look like moths and they're completely harmless to people in terms of biting. They do not bite. Uh, this is actually a picture of my uh, daughter when she was a little girl, this was many years ago, but I would always take my children out all, along the St. Lawrence River on our expeditions to collect insects and to do other research. This is where Brachycentris incanus occurs. It only occurs from about Brockville, Ontario, down to about Morrisburg, Ontario, uh, with the center of being around Cardinal. Uh, you don't find them upstream from there. You don't find them downstream from there. And so for many, many years, as long as uh, we've kept records, uh, they have been known only along this particular stretch of river. <clears throat> well, the interesting thing about that stretch of river is, as I said, it's the most a narrow part of the river, the currents are very, very powerful. And as it turns out, and I'll show you, these larvae actually live in deeper water than we would have imagined. 
when I came in the mid 1980s and started studying these things, one of the things I learned from people is that no one really knew where the larvae developed. Nobody had seen the larvae. They had only seen these tremendous swarms that would come about in late May and early June. So in order to find these, we actually had to go through a, a number of techniques. One of those was scuba diving. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get some good data from that, but we couldn't do it for long because frankly, I almost lost my wife on one of the dives. Uh, it's, it's very treacherous diving there. Again, the, the, the currents are so very high that uh, it's, it's not the kind of place you would go a lot just for the sport of diving. This is what the larvae look like when you finally do pull them out of the bottom. Uh, very cute little insects crawling along the bottom, but they make these little uh, rectangular cases out of shreds of vegetation. They glue those things together and then they live inside and it's open at both ends. So they stick out one end and you can see uh, little ones right here above the ruler with their little legs sticking out. Their legs are equipped with tiny bristles and they hold those out in the water and, and catch plankton. So what these things are doing, they're uh, very important in the ecosystem because they filter plankton that's coming pouring down out of the Great Lakes through the St. Lawrence River. Uh, they eat that and then uh, they return that into the food chain by being themselves eaten by fish, by uh, other animals in the depths of the river. So this is uh, right in the center. You can see up here in the upper right, you can see Cardinal Ontario. So this is the, the epicenter of where these live. And again, uh, this is the, the highest current area probably of, of the entire St. Lawrence River. As it turns out, even though it makes it treacherous for people to study, uh, it's actually where these, these caddisflies like to live. So we did two dives, one on the US side, at around Red Mills, New York. The other on the other side, uh, just off of uh, Cardinal, uh, just upstream from Cardinal. And what we did is we ran transects out into the water and with depth, we measured uh, the depth at each point and collected uh, the caddisfly larvae using quadrats that we had developed that were heavily weighted. Uh, I could go on and on and tell you about these dives. Again, they were very treacherous. Uh, I would not want to do them again. Uh, we literally had to carry, in addition to being very heavily weighted with our scuba gear with lead weights, we also had to carry with us bags of rocks just to, just to hold us down because the currents were so strong. Here's what we found. We found that the reason no one had seen the larvae of this species is that if you look at one meter of depth, already pretty, you know, uh, most people looking casually in the water, uh, wouldn't even get to a meter depth. That's a difficult place. You could, you could go there with a net. At two meters, you have a few larvae. At three meters, now you're well over your head. Uh, uh, this is where you, they start building up in numbers. And you can see uh, here, uh, you go up to six meters and then eight meters and finally 12 meters, the deepest water that we sampled. And it's there at 12 meters. That's a lot of water. Uh, and again, very, very high current water that's where they reach their maximum densities. And we uh, recorded densities of right at 17,000 larvae per square meter of bottom. This is when we really recognized that in fact, it wasn't just the big swarms on land that we saw every year, that these uh, organisms are truly what we would call benthic keystone species. A keystone species is a species that really plays a very major role in structuring the entire ecosystem in that area. So with 17,000 larvae per square meter in these bottom areas uh, of the river, uh, certainly these would qualify in that respect. Well, besides the work out in the field, uh, we come back to the laboratory and do a number of other studies, trying to learn a little bit about the biology of these organisms. Uh, this is, that's me there in, at the Prescott Coast Guard Station looking at buoys. We'll come back to the buoys later. Uh, this is my wife, Denise, who is my collaborator, works with me on just about every kind of project you can imagine. Here she is in the laboratory here at Barry College. Barry, by the way, is near Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm reporting to you right now from near Atlanta. So I'm down here in the sunny and tonight rainy south. But here she is uh, with me examining uh, these larvae in the laboratory. One of the things we did is we wanted to get an idea about their growth. And so uh, we did do some collecting at, on two different weeks. Uh, and during those two weeks, you can see, these are what we call length frequency distribution. And basically you can see that these are growing 
uh, in the middle of uh, July, just a few weeks after the maiden swarms, uh, they're growing at a pretty rapid rate, going from 3.4 or 3.59 millimeters up to 4.6, about a millimeter of growth in a, in a one week period. So they're growing pretty quickly once they get back into the water. Remember that the eggs were laid about that first week of June. So this is just a little bit more than a month after the eggs were laid and the larvae hatched. We also dissected a lot of the larvae that we collected uh, to try to get an idea of what they're eating. And this gives you an idea of what they're eating. Of all those that we dissected, 4.8% of them had crustaceans in their gut, uh, cyanobacteria in uh, 9.5%, protists or protozoans in about almost 20%, green algae in 19%, and then diatoms uh, were the most commonly encountered in almost half of the larvae. So uh, again, this gives us an idea of what they're eating. It confirms what we already uh, felt we knew. And uh, that was that uh, they are in fact taking plankton, phytoplankton, as well as zooplankton out of the water, returning it into the bottom and making it available to other organisms. Uh, this is just a similar pie chart showing the number of taxa, just showing that in fact, uh, most of these, when we would dissect them and look at them, they would have been feeding primarily on just one of those groups of organisms that I mentioned. Uh, and you can see uh, the two taxa, three taxa, and so forth. Also, 11.6% uh, of those that we sampled uh, did not have anything in their guts at the time. But if you want to know a lot more about the insects, you have to use even more refined techniques. So uh, in my work, I do a lot of electron microscopy where I study reproductive and developmental biology at the cellular and at the subcellular level. On your left there is a scanning electron microscope. We use that for looking at the surface uh, of animals, but looking at it at, 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 at very high magnifications. Your standard light microscope will uh, magnify up to about a thousand times. A dissecting microscope usually will only magnify up to about a hundred times. Uh, with the scanning electron microscope, you can magnify up 20, 30, or 40,000 times. So you can uh, see very, very small details on the surface. On the right is a transmission electron microscope. Uh, with this one, we actually cut thin slices of the animals and we use that for looking actually inside the cells at the subcellular structure. We found some interesting things. Uh, on the left, you see, uh, first of all, on the upper left, a light microscope image. These uh, caddisflies are really interesting in that they carry their egg mass around on the outside of their body, something not real common among insects. Most insects leave their eggs inside and then lay them uh, only when it's time uh, for, for the egg to be laid. These, as soon as they've copulated, they tend to extrude this egg mass that they fly around with, uh, a gelatinous mass hanging onto the back of their abdomen. You can see it with a scanning electron micrograph in the lower image. But the image to the right shows what happens if you look right, if you take the egg mass off and you look directly into the back of the, uh, of the insect, it looks like a catcher's mitt. So if you're in the baseball, this looks like a catcher's mitt. It's a, a deeply concave area. As it turns out, it's highly adapted for holding on to that egg mass in flight. They've got to carry that egg mass out and then they go into the river and simply dive into the river. The female dies then at that time. She's finished with her job. Uh, and then these gelatinous masses drift to the bottom. But we looked in detail at how this whole apparatus works, a fascinating uh, process. First of all, you have the ovipositor at the top. That's where the egg mass is extruded, where it comes out. But as it comes out, it curves downward and ultimately makes contact with the bottom here. Uh, the spine, there are spines that catch uh, the egg mass as it comes. And then as it keeps coming out, it literally rolls and coils up back into this concavity. Uh, there it is held in place by these dorsolateral pads, these ventrolateral pads, which have spines on them that I'll show you in greater detail here. This is actually uh, the, the ventrolateral pad. So what happens is this, uh, as this egg mass rolls back up into this concavity, this catcher's myth that the female has, it's held in place by, by these uh, adhesive spines. It sort of works like Velcro, it just grabs into the matrix of the jelly and holds them in place. In the meantime, you've also got these sensory bristles. You can tell that they're sensory, that we call them sensilla in insects, because uh, instead of being attached directly to the exoskeleton like the spines are, these actually go into a small socket. 
in that small socket that allows them to uh, make contact with uh, nerve cells. Uh, so these are sensory bristles that are used uh, probably to help guide this process of making the egg mass and then carrying it. So that was something novel. We also looked at uh, the egg masses themselves. We take liquid nitrogen, plunge these things into liquid nitrogen, fracture it, and uh, you can see how the eggs are placed in there. Here's the plane of fracture. And then if you take the same specimen and you, you section it and look at it in another way, you see here, uh, the pale lavender at the top is the egg mass itself, and then there's the space with the egg. The thin little layer right here that surrounds the egg is the chorion. In terrestrial insects, the chorion would be quite thick, and these it's quite thin because there's no real protective role needed. Uh, these are protected by the gelatinous mass, and then of course they're in the water and, and hatch uh, very quickly. You can also see here, so there's the gelatinous egg mass matrix. There's the chorion follicle cells, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then the oocyte itself, the actual egg cell. We wanted to know more about this, though, because as it turns out, we found out that even though caddisflies live all over the world and are very common and very important, uh, the, the reproductive systems had never been studied in detail for any caddisfly species. So we decided to look at that. What you've got here is uh, we've simply dissected one of the females, taken her whole genital system out, the genital system of the female consists of paired ovaries, by uh, one ovary on each side. Our accessory glands, the accessory glands are responsible for secreting the gelatinous material that these things are packaged in that I just showed you. And then the back here is the back of the exoskeleton. That's the egg mass receptacle. That's the thing that I just showed you. That's the catcher's mitt that I just showed you. So the eggs move through the oviducts. They're joined by material from the accessory glands, and then they're rolled out onto the back end insect. So we were really excited to look at this in detail. And within the uh, ovaries, you have ovarioles, and the ovarioles contain an oocyte, but also nurse cells. Without going into a lot of detail, I'll just say this is characteristic of all the very advanced insects, like the true flies, like the, uh, the hymenopterans, which would be bees, ants, wasps, and so forth. Uh, the, the butterflies and moths, and uh, as it turns out, caddisflies. Nurse cells are actually sister cells for the oocyte. They're actually germ cells. But what they do is it's a very interesting thing. Uh, initially, the oocyte and the nurse cells are all one clump, but th they divide three times so that you have eight cells. Seven of those eight cells decide to become nurse cells and simply to support the growth of the one favored sister cell, the oocyte. And they do that by supplying her with nutrients so that the one cell then grows to a nice robust size and has all she needs entering into embryonic development after fertilization. The whole mass is surrounded by follicle cells, which are just normal cells of the body of the reproductive system. Uh, to really see what's going on with these though, you need to use transmission electron microscopy. I'm not gonna go into detail about this report. It's been published. Uh, quite a few years ago now, but just to show you the kind of detail we're able to see, here you can see the nurse cells, the follicle cells, and the oocyte. The follicle cells are busy feeding yolk material to the oocyte, and they also produce the chorion. That's the layer that surrounds the egg that, that appears as a black band here. The nurse cells, on the other hand, these sister cells, they are busy simply making lots and lots of uh, messenger RNA, transcripts of RNA, because the RNA is necessary so that once the oocyte is fertilized, it can undergo very rapid division and create uh, very quickly uh, a full multicellular larva, the little larva that hatches out and then crawls along the bottom like I just showed you. So these nurse cells do have a very important role in getting uh, all of the information, these uh, messenger RNA transcripts that are used uh, for making the proteins necessary for every element of uh, the embryonic process. Okay, but because it's so difficult to actually study these uh, with scuba diving or with uh, grab sampling or anything like that, uh, we've gone to using navigational buoys. All of you on the river have seen these things. They're very large buoys. They float on the top. They're attached by a chain to a big concrete anchor, or anchor on the bottom. We're very fortunate in the St. Lawrence River that every winter when the seaway is closed, they will take these out of the water and put them on land, especially there at Prescott, 
uh, and also along the New York side in, in Clayton, New York, in Ogdensburg, New York, in Messina, New York. So you can go up to these buoys when they're on land and uh, you, if you get there, as soon as they've been put out of the water, you can uh, find animals of various sorts on them. So we've used this as a very powerful tool. We borrowed techniques from a coral reef biologists. Coral reef uh, biologists often have to survey large areas uh, where they can't go in underwater because they are scuba diving. They don't have the time to do very careful quantitative accounts, and they can't do destructive sampling on the coral reefs because the coral reefs are, are protected. So instead of trying to count numbers of organisms, they can get a, a quick picture of them by simply ranking them. A rank of zero, no, no organisms, and then basically one to 25% coverage is a rank of one, and you can see the figures as we go up, up to 100% coverage where it's a rank of four. So by using these ranks, again, you can't get precise numbers, but you get good enough numbers to show you major trends in distribution and changes of distribution over time uh, with these different organisms. So these are the primary areas we've been studying. One area along from uh, Toronto all the way across the Bay of Quinty, almost to Kingston, then the area around Kingston, which is a much shallower water area, just before the water leaves Lake Ontario and goes into the St. Lawrence system. And then the entire upper part of the St. Lawrence River down to about Cornwall. And we've done some sampling all the way into Montreal. This is from 1990, one of the navigational buoys in that narrow part of the river. And you can see the large number of caddis fly cases there. Okay, they're all sort of piled up on each other at this point because of the disruption of pulling them from the water. Uh, but you can see again that these are living there on the river bottom at very, very high density. This is a picture I took just this year. So here we are, uh, what, 30 years later, still looking at these. Uh, we've gotten to where we try to do a little bit of quantification of these, but as I'll show you in a minute, the numbers of brachycentrists have declined uh, rather dramatically since the invasion of the river by zebra mussels, uh, because zebra mussels and these caddis flies are directly competing with one another, both for substrate and for uh, the planktonic food. Uh, we use these little uh, 10, uh, 10 centimeter square uh, just basically taping rulers together. And this gives us a very easy way, even when it's, uh, as it was this year, it was about 12 degrees uh, below zero uh, Fahrenheit, so quite cold uh, this year. It makes it difficult to get out and do this, this sampling, but if we could just slap this thing up against uh, the substrate, uh, against the buoy or against the anchor, take a picture of it, then we can take it back to the laboratory and do the counting to show you the kinds of data we get from this, and I won't belabor it too much. Uh, this is from 1990 to 2005. We made several trips uh, to look at the buoys. Uh, first of all, this is uh, from the left to the right. This is from Niagara, Niagara River all the way to Cornwall, Ontario. Uh, and here you see this intermediate part of the river. This is where we found the Ranky Centris. What's important here is that these lines are one, two, three, and four ranks. So we had some with the rank of four, several with the rank of three, lots of caddis flies in the river at the time. That's in 1990. That's about the time the zebra mussels came in. By 2005, when the zebra mussels had become very well established, we had a distribution like this. Now, this is not comparable because this line at the top of the blue is a rank of four, which is 100% coverage. This is only a rank of one. So in that period of time, we had gone from a large number of buoys that had these caddis flies and at very high densities to a very small number, only four buoys that had the caddis flies at a very low density. Uh, and then this one is an intermediate period. Uh, also, these are slightly different uh, uh, parts of the river. Uh, this, for example, just goes from Toronto Lac Saint Louis near uh, just upstream from Montreal, and the same at the bottom from Toronto to near Montreal. So again, they're found only in that very narrow stretch of the river, none upstream or downstream from there. Good news about caddis flies, though, is they are not just eccentric. We have other caddis flies like hydropsyche, chimatopsyche, and some others. They are also insects. Uh, they, they actually live on the buoys and, and uh, you see them crawling around like little worms and they're actually, they're, they've been known for so long by the people who work on the seaway and that uh, manage the buoys, they call them buoy worms. 
are fascinating insects. They don't make a case, but what they do is they spin silken webs. They create a little silken tunnel uh, right on the substrate, pack it with mud, and then they make little uh, silken webs that they use like fishermen to uh, strain plankton out of the water. This is what they look like. Uh, this is a buoy uh, taken in 2003. Now these are not down in that narrow part of the river. These come pr are primarily in the area around Cornwall. Uh, this particular picture is made from a buoy in Messina that we uh, looked at in 2003. And from our counts there, we were seeing up to about 4,000 of these per square meter. Not as many as we saw with the other, with the brachycentris, but nevertheless, again, uh, this qualifies clearly as a keystone species. And, and again, the coverage, uh, this is one part of a buoy, the side of the buoy, uh, they covered the entire buoy uh, at just this density. And so that's the way it was in 2003, long after the zebra mussels had come in. Well, uh, this is 2009, you still see them. Each one of these little tubes is, has got a little worm-like larva in it, in the water, living there on the bottom. This is buoy number 16. Uh, in the Cornwall Messina area, 2008 navigation year. We, so we sampled it in uh, January 2009. That same buoy this year, I went back this year. Uh, this was just four weeks ago. I was back up there, uh, same buoy number 16. And here you can see it from the water line all the way down to the bottom where you no longer have buoy. It is 100% covered by a, a ranking of four, 100% covered uh, with these uh, with these buoy worms, or these hydrocycid caddisflies. So again, we're looking at a species that is very, very dominant in the system here. And undoubtedly at this kind of density, uh, it, it is a, ecologically one of the most important species of animals in the river. Uh, and again, this is just showing the quantification. We use a little one centimeter quadrant. So this is from January 4th, 2022. So a little less than a month ago. Uh, that I was up there uh, studying them. And you can actually down at the bottom here below the little rulers, you can see the little black worm looking larvae that have crawled out of their tubes. So basically, here's the picture. The blue up here, these are the hydrocycids. These are the buoy worms. They exist in that part of the river, uh, uh, starting at about Morrisburg. They take, they take uh, off where the brachycentrids leave off. The brachycentrids again from about Brockville to Morrisburg. Interestingly, once you get into the very uppermost part of the river in the Thousand Islands region and into the Kingston uh, basin there of Lake Ontario, uh, you, you still get some caddisflies, but the most dominant benthic arthropod in that region uh, is amphipods, amphipods which are not insects but are a, a type of crustacean related to shrimp and, and crabs and fish and so forth, but the amphipods dominate in that part of the river and the lake. Well, it's too bad that it's not all native. We also have invasive species, and I know everybody probably listening, anybody who's familiar with the Great Lakes or the St. Lawrence River knows about Dreisinid mussels. It was in the late uh, 1980s that the zebra mussels came in, and when I started working with people from both the U.S. and the Canadian side, as well as uh, our neighbors there in the uh, Aquasasni community, and uh, we started working on how to manage various things, uh, industries, facilities of uh, uh, you know, water, uh, water supplies, uh, power production and so forth, uh, how we would manage those facilities in the wake of these mussels that came in from Europe. And of course you can see now from this map uh, from, not, from January, 2021, just a year ago, uh, the, these mussels have now spread throughout uh, the United States as well as Canada. But, pardon me, they became primary uh, invading, newly colonizing keystone species in the St. Lawrence very quickly. They did a lot to damage our native unionid uh, clams uh, that were in the river. And you can see the kind of densities where they were. Here's once again, my wonderful wife who, who treks with me through any number of things. But you can see this was this is above a rank of four. This is a multi-layered rank of four. This is what, uh, within the few years after the zebra mussels came into the area, this is what they looked like along the bottom of the river, uh, completely coated uh, the buoys. In fact, what you see uh, below her hand, that's the chain, the large buoy chain. So uh, these occur in, in tremendous, tremendous numbers. 
Uh, and these particular buoys are actually from the area around uh, around the city of Kingston. And so in those shallow waters, they are still quite common. Uh, once you get into the river though, we don't have so many of the Dreisenids anymore. Uh, these buoys you can see from the T up here, that's from the Toronto area. K is from the Kingston area. And so you can see where these buoys came from. This is another important thing about using these buoys is they always are in exactly the same place in the river every year, year after year. So you know exactly where the things attached to them came from. And here you see Denise again, uh, looking at these, uh, all the little speckles you see uh, on these buoys uh, are the mussels. And uh, you can also get a good idea of how big these buoys are. Again, we're getting, uh, using this one, two, three, four ranking system, we get at least a good picture of general patterns of abundance and density. So here from the 2006 navigation year, you can see lots of the mussels in the Toronto Harbor area, even more of them in the Kingston Harbor area. But once you get into the St. Lawrence River, even though you still have them on lots of the buoys, they're not on all the buoys and uh, they are, only reach up about a rank of one, about a, a zero to 25% coverage of the buoy. So again, looking at that, you can see the power of this technique, not very precise, accurate numbers, but solid numbers that do give you the general patterns. Here's an interesting one from 2004. You can see here going from Toronto to Montreal, basically here, uh, you see on the top, you see the Dreisenids, on the bottom, you see the hydrosacid caddisflies. Uh, so they, they don't overlap much at all. All the area around Cornwall and Messina, uh, you have these huge densities of buoy worms. You don't get the Dreisenids. We believe that part of that may be that the uh, native caddisflies are out competing the Dreisenids, possibly even collecting, catching the Dreisenid uh, villager larvae that are in the plankton and eating them. But nevertheless, you have where you have uh, the hydrocycid caddisflies, uh, you have the Dreisenids dropping off, and that pattern uh, still persists. The data that we collected just a few weeks ago, uh, we're still seeing the same pattern all along the uh, the river. So, uh, basically, uh, the Thousand Island area has some Dreisenids, uh, quite a few Dreisenids, but no caddisflies. But once you get into the Cornwall Messina area, uh, you get very few of the mussels, but lots of the caddisflies, the hydrocycids in particular. Although the brachycentrids remain quite low. Well, just one other, I'm just gonna give you a very quick uh, summary of something we were doing. So if you wonder if there's any good that can be done with these invasive mussels, we actually have found a way. There, uh, any major river, any major river in the world is going to be a major corridor for the movement of human and animal pathogens. Zoonotic pathogens are pathogens that infect both humans and animals, and they move along waterways. Many of them are disseminated through the river. Some of the most important ones that we've studied are Giardia, Cryptosporidium and the microsporidia, encephalozoan uh, and introcytozoan. What we've done is we've uh, recruited these mussels, use them as what we call sentinel monitors up here on the upper left. We use them as sentinel monitors. So rather than having to go out to various places and take water samples ourselves, we can go and collect these mussels from the buoys, like I just showed you. So we may have as many as 100 up to 300, some years 300 different buoys, 300 different data points where we can scrape the mussels off. We can take them back to the laboratory. We can look at them with microscopes using standard uh, staining techniques like this acid test stain here in the pink, or we can use immunofluorescence microscopy uh, along with either uh, uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, you're familiar with that from the COVID uh, test that you're taking, but also we use a technique where we look at ribosomal RNA oligonucleotides. It's called the fluorescent in situ hybridization influorescent antibody, immunofluorescent antibody technique. And we can very precisely find these pathogens in uh, the homogenized tissues of the muscles that we took from the buoys. So by coupling the buoys in their precise location with these modern molecular techniques, uh, we can get a lot of information. Oh, excuse me. And here you can see some of it. Uh, excuse me. Uh, you can see here the numbers of buoys. Uh, the, the, the bars represent the total number of, of all of those pathogens I showed you, all of which cause diarrhea and even worse, some of them can be fatal. In fact, cryptosporidiosis is one of the top three killers, diarrheal killers of children in the world. Um, and you can see 
uh, the relative numbers along the river. Pretty much all of the areas are contaminated, some a bit more than others. But when you get down on the micro scale, you can see some major differences. For example, you see here, uh, uh, Toronto Harbor on this particular year was almost uncontaminated. Whereas once you get down into the, to the Kingston area, you get a lot more of these pathogens. We believe that relates to the more agricultural land where a lot of the animals, cattle and so forth are infected or in around Kingston. Uh, we also believe it's because of the shallow, higher sediment water around Kingston relative to the deeper, colder waters around Toronto. So you can see we start now getting patterns uh, in a totally different type of research, uh, looking at uh, human health and uh, being able hopefully one day using this method to, uh, to be able to predict outbreaks or to predict uh, when certain pathogens are more likely to occur in the area. And I'm just gonna leave you with this. This is the end. This is the, one of the newest invaders of the St. Lawrence system. I've been working with my friend, Tony Riccardi. He's a professor at the Red Path Museum at McGill University in Montreal. And we've just done a study together where we've been looking at a new invader from Asia, the Asiatic clam or Asian clam, Corbicula fluminia. And uh, it's, just, it's been established in the Southern United States for a long time, but the only has just recently moved into the St. Lawrence system. It is not a cold water organism. So what we've done, we just put a paper on this. We've been looking at cold tolerance and it's helping us to understand how an invasive species may eventually move from warmer into colder waters. And uh, this gives us an idea about how new invasions occur altogether. So with that, I'm going to stop and I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, our my host, and uh, we'll see how it goes from there. So I will stop sharing, I guess. And Stephanie? Yes, thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you for taking the time and for sharing the sampling methods and all these interesting aspects of your research. Um, so coming from Georgia as well, it's nice to hear about the St. Lawrence River and this Sorry, I'm getting some texts from some questions. So we'll start with some questions. We have one from Nick Cox. And so I'm gonna read it off of Facebook. I'm just gonna set up my screen here. Um, okay, so Nick is saying, 20 years ago, the sh shad flies along the river were so numerous, the roads were gr greasy and it was impossible to breathe. Now they're almost gone. Can you comment on, on the cause of this change? And he, he goes on to say, my question above relates to the five miles of river just east of the dam. The current is high and the depth about five to seven meters. In the 1950s and 70s, it was almost impossible to keep them out of the paper mill. Mm -hmm. uh, great observation. And again, the reason I first discovered these caddisflies is because when I arrived uh, to work at St. Lawrence University in 1985, uh, it was all the talk. People talked about this great phenomenon, uh, literally millions, possibly billions of these insects swarming out of the river and then just disappearing. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they have caused a lot of, in fact, a lot of trouble. Some people developed allergies because there were so many of them uh, and they were known to cause actually automobile collisions. Those little sticky egg masses would hit the windshield and they would, you don't want to turn your windshield wipers on because it would just smear them along. Uh, we believe that what happened to them was uh, the competition from the Dreissenid mussels. Uh, there was all, we've got a lot of data on that. There was almost a perfect uh, correlation between the movement and establishment of the European mussels in the river and in the lakes uh, and the disappearance of many kinds of uh, animals, including those unionic clams that I showed. But with the caddis flies, again, uh, we think that the caddis flies and the zebra mussels are direct competitors, both for the food. They're both filter feeders. They both feed on the same basic plankton species. They both uh, need hard bottom substrates to attach to. Uh, and so uh, it seems that in the case of the brachycentric caddis flies, they were not successful at out competing the Dreissenids. Again, it looks like perhaps uh, these very different, still filter feeders, but filter feeding hydrocycids that are up near Cornwall and uh, Messina area now, they use a very different kind of technique, again, making these burrows and, and using these silken webs. Uh, somehow they seem to be able to uh, uh, get the upper hand on 
the zebra mussels and probably have been responsible for keeping them out of that part of the river. So it's something we don't have absolute answers on at this point. We've just got these correlations, but that is what uh, we think for now. Uh, I may want to mention too, when we first started diving in the river in the 1980s, before the zebra mussels came in, uh, my wife and I, it was quite romantic. We would hold hands, but the reason we held hands under the water is because that's the only way we could stay together. Uh, you couldn't see beyond as far as you could reach your hand. When we uh, later do dove in the river, you could sit at the bottom uh, in 15 meters of water and you could look all the way to the top and see your uh, dive flag. Uh, the water had cleared up just that much from, uh, we believe, the, the mussels coming in. So they really depleted uh, the plankton a lot. It, it remains somewhat depleted, but things have come back to a better balance now. I've uh, marked down, so the last week of May, I'm going to go to Cardinal to see this, or at least what's left of, of their emergence. Um, so th thank you. And thank you, Nick, for that question. Uh, Philip Ling, he's saying, fascinating to sample the mussels as sentinels of pathogens. So that was a really interesting aspect of this research. Mm -hmm. And we're still working on that. And we're thinking about, by the way, trying to do the same thing with the caddisflies. Uh, because people around the world are starting to pick up on our methods and using them uh, in Asia and Europe uh, in the major river systems. Uh, but not every river has those same mussels, but uh, you often find caddisflies. So we're thinking they may also be a good uh, sentinel uh, organism for us. Um, so Marianne, she says, great presentation. And she asks, why do you think the river sections are so different in terms of dominant taxa? Uh, again, that's a great question, and it would just be a guess, because all you can do is you can point to uh, the, the hydrographic differences in those areas. Uh, in the upper part, you know, the, the, uh, although you have current, of course, throughout the river, the currents really are much stronger right in that most narrow part. If you just look at the river the way, it's a very narrow corridor right there between Morrisburg up to Brockville and so on. Uh, of course, once you get into the Thousand Islands, things really change. The river is much wider there. And of course, uh, you have the islands that uh, break the river up. And then once you get downstream from Morrisburg down toward uh, uh, Cornwall, for example, uh, again, the river widens a bit and the substrate uh, changes a bit. So um, I, I think it just has to do with that these species are very tuned in. Brachycentrids, for example, in general, love fast flowing water. Uh, we have a lot of brachycentric species that don't live in large rivers. They live in small streams, but they live where there are lots of what we call riffles, a lot of flowing water flowing uh, turbulently over the rocks. And that's where the bra brachycentrics like to live. So this particular one seems to have just really adapted to and grown up with this major river system. But again, uh, they're very deep, uh, uh, very deep in these high current areas. But uh, that's why we're going to keep working on these. We, we would love to answer some of those questions. That it's going to be fun to keep chasing these things down and understanding exactly uh, where things live and why they live there. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, uh, Marianne, for the question. Uh, Marianne has another question for you. Okay. So <laughs> what does it mean for the river to lose so much Brachycentrid abundance? Do you expect them to make a return or are the mussels too competitive? Another great question, and again, uh, the most people who've been studying the mussels have noted that they they peaked in the river in the 2000s, uh, and then they have dropped back off. And even again, just four weeks ago when we were sampling, we saw the same pattern. You don't really get many mussels in the river itself uh, relative to what we did at one time. And it seems like the brachycentrids may be uh, coming back a little bit in response to that. They're still there. You saw the one picture I showed that was from a buoy there in, uh, that I saw, I examined in uh, Messina just four weeks ago. Uh, they seem to be coming back. Uh, and even though that buoy was in Messina, uh, it had been taken from farther up the river, up closer to Morrisburg, uh, uh, Waddington on the uh, New York side. So uh, we, we think and we hope that they're coming back. Also, this is an area where our method is a limiting method. I mean, we've got to remember that what you see on the buoy is not a true profile of the entire river. So it may be that, uh, for example, the hydrocycid caddisflies seem to really like the buoys themselves. 
the brachycentra, we only see a few of those on the buoys, where we really see the large numbers of those are on the concrete anchors well, all the way down at the bottom. Again, they like that very deep water. So it may be that there have been more brachycentra remaining in the river uh, than we think, certainly enough to repopulate as, uh, the, as, as the mussels uh, go down in their abundance. But as the first questioner mentioned, uh, we know that they're not there in the same abundance because they don't make the same swarms. The swarms are not anywhere close to what they were. Uh, so if there are no adult swarms in uh, the spring and early summer, then that means that the larvae aren't in the river either. So we, we hope that will come back. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you again, Marianne, for your question. I just got a comment from Bailey Bedard. She says, super interesting work, Bruce, and great presentation. You have some fans. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and so Nick is asking, does the loss of shad flies off Cornwall relate to the reduction of yellow perch in Lake St. Francis? Their numbers must have been a significant uh, quantity of fish food. Another great question, and to be honest with you, I'm not an ichthyologist. I'm not, a, I would rather uh, turn a question like that maybe to, to uh, Courtney or somebody else. I don't know. Uh, I have not really looked a lot. We, we've looked at what the chat, the, the caddis flies are eating. We have not looked at all really at what's eating the caddis flies. And frankly, I don't know that much about the dynamics between the fish and, uh, and the caddis flies there in the river. Um, so, all I can say is that it's a great question and I really don't know, but undoubtedly when you see something that occurs in such large numbers and such large densities, obviously a very important part of food chains, then uh, it certainly would make sense that uh, they would have an impact on the populations of whatever fish are eating them. I, I don't know if yellow perch in particular are eating them or not. Somebody else could, could possibly uh, know that. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's definitely something that we'll we'll need to look into. Uh, we have a few fish biologists at the River Institute, so that would be a big, good question to bring up yeah. to them. Um, the next question is from Philip Ling. So he's saying, I'm in Maitland in the Narrows. Would we find higher concentrations in the deeper seaway section where the flow is high? Based on the very limited data we have, again, it's limited because we uh, we have only seen these, we've only measured their densities directly in these very few dives we've done. Uh, and, and we're not likely to repeat them again because it, it, that type of diving really is quite uh, dangerous. I don't know if some of you even remember or even Jacques Cousteau when they filmed their St. Lawrence River uh, series. I think it was a three part series. One of their uh, experienced divers actually died in the St. Lawrence River, uh, of, I think of embolism and possibly related to the currents. But uh, it, it's going to be difficult to get a little uh, more on that. Uh, from what we have seen, though, I would say I would predict that, yes, it's that these things are hanging out in the deeper parts where the current mm -hmm. is high, but also where there's depth. Uh, the current where we did the diving, it, it was high current even at, near the shore. But you saw how at one and two and four meters, there weren't many. And you, you really got the big densities when you got up to 12 meters of depth. Great, thank you. And thank you, Phil, for your question. I have a couple questions that came in on text. So um, Courtney, she's asking, where did the idea first come from to sample from the buoys? Uh, we started that, we actually started that and it, it had been used before. I mean, over the years here and there, you would see something from somewhere in the world. Remember every navigable, major navigable waterway in the world, even the ocean waters have navigation buoys. And so uh, from time to time, people would use those to collect things. Uh, when we really saw the use of those as a major tool is when the zebra mussel invasion came about. Uh, the, the, the zebra mussels came, everyone was uh, really very concerned, very uh, frightened, frankly, about what they could and would do and, and what in many cases they did when they came into the system. Uh, you know, they closed out an entire uh, water intake system for the city of Cleveland, Ohio. They, they closed down an entire power plant uh, in Detroit uh, just by clogging things up. Uh, 
I, I did a lot of work with uh, Ontario Hydro and the New York Power Authority there on the Moses Saunders Dam. Uh, we were concerned about the hydroelectric generation possibilities there. Uh, so we were trying to figure out how we could monitor the movement of the zebra mussels into the river. They had not fully come into the river at the, at when we started. Uh, and that's when we came upon the idea of using the buoys because they were attaching to the buoys. They were causing problems with the seaway workers on that. So we thought, you know, let's put this to good use. Let's use these buoys. Again, they're perfect. They're all marked with signs. They, they are in a specific place every year. Uh, we can use that to our uh, uh, advantage. And in fact, uh, that's when it got started. And again, I'm, I'm happy to say that pioneering work has now been picked up by a lot of other people around the world that are starting to use uh, the buoys for monitoring various types of biological uh, fowlers. Thank you. And thank you, Courtney, for your question. I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody who's watching from your TV. So thank you again for tuning into Science and Nature Untapped. We'll be back next month to learn about climate change in the city of Cornwall with Angela Parker. So stay tuned for that. So thank you again for tuning in. OK, so I have a question that came in from uh, Brian Hickey. And Great. Brian wants to know, how many different Trichoptera species do we find in the Cornwall area? Oh, uh, I can't answer that right off the top of my head. I probably could have 10 years ago when I was uh, working on the river. Again, I've just gotten back into it. So I'm having to go back and, and remind myself of a lot of those details. There are many. Uh, they're not all just these three that I mentioned. Uh, in fact, we have not really gone very far in identifying all of the buoy worms. Uh, that would be undoubtedly be probably not only several species, but several different families that could be involved with that. Uh, most of, uh, a lot of what we know was actually done back in, oh, when was it? Uh, this was even old for me. Back in when the Expo, uh, the World, uh, World Fair came to Montreal. And uh, they were very concerned about that. One of the things they were concerned about being a nuisance for the World's Fair was that they were having these major swarms of caddisflies all through Montreal. So they put teams of biologists to go out and to uh, identify all the uh, caddisflies, figure out what they were. And if you look into that literature, I think it's from the 1960s into the early 1970s, uh, you'll find a whole series of papers on the caddisflies of Loch uh, St. Louis and uh, all, all of the Montreal area, basically. And those would be very similar to what we have around Cornwall. I don't know that anyone has ever looked very carefully at the, the total uh, caddisfly fauna of the Cornwall area, but it's something that uh, we certainly uh, should be working on over the coming years. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you, uh, Brian, for your question. Uh, we just have a comment from Matt Windle. So he's saying, thank you, Bruce, for an excellent presentation. So great to get that long-term perspective on the ecosystem changes in the river. Yeah, great. And so I don't have any new questions right now. I'll give everybody, um, I'll give everybody a minute in case they do have a question. Um, I guess for myself, I, I think I'll have a new appreciation for these swarms uh, in the spring and summer, and I'm kind of super excited to see them uh, when they do happen, even though in the, in the past it's been very kind of been a nuisance, but now I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So thank you for, you know, sharing your, your interests with us. And all, all those bothersome swarms to you mean a healthy river out there, uh, lots of things living out there doing well keeping our river healthy and, and then that in turn keeps us healthy. Absolutely. Thank you for the reminder. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have no more questions. And so I Great. think we can wrap it up at, right at eight o'clock. So um, thank you again for uh, being here and taking the time to share your research with us. And uh, thank you everybody who tuned in and for your wonderful questions as usual. Uh, we'll see you next month. I guess it will be March 2nd. We're gonna have Science and Nature. We're gonna be learning about climate change with Angela Parker from the city of Cornwall. So thank you again for tuning in and have a wonderful evening. Great, thank you very much to everyone.